So welcome to the Market Mentors podcast, Alan. Hey, Matt. Delighted to be here. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolute pleasure. Now, before we dig into this one, I'd love to know what your relationship is with B2B SaaS marketing. Gosh, I go right back to the annals of time, Matt, when um, I was on a 56K dial-up uh, and I was uh, tr- trying to get a faster connection and recognized that fast connections are going to be the future software. So I've been involved ever since uh, the start. So um, I've had a kind of fascinating journey working with B2B SaaS since it first emerged. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. So, and and with SaaS marketing in particular then, why do you think it's so different? I think it's just intellectually so challenging, right? There's, um, you know, a whole range of things you've got to think about. So traditional marketing, B2C, you know, big budgets, um, often transactional based software is all about, you know, trying to attract people to a website trying to convert them. So the first kind of big challenge is, can you bring volumes of people to your website? Then can you kind of convince them that there's a merit in what you're offering, getting them to convert? And then you've got to retain them because you've got to kind of fight to retain them to um, to get the longevity. Because I guess what's baked into it is that you kind of de-risk it up front for people, Matt. You're, you're really trying to say, actually, this is a long game. And the unit economics really only work if people stick around for the long haul. So it kind of creates challenges for you at all different um, starts at the junction. And also it's sort of very fascinating because there are no apples to apples. Much as your listeners would love to have a playbook, you know, it really is very, very nuanced. So there are some of the things that I think make it so fascinating. Yeah, it's all about the lifetime value, isn't it? And especially, I guess, for startups in particular, if you're putting the, the value of that sale across a year, for instance, you've got short-term pressure in terms of funding. Well, that's a that's a great point, right? And one of my bugbears, um, I'm based in London, right? And one of my bugbears is that it's a really it puts a lot of pressure on cash flow um, SaaS businesses because you've got all these sales and marketing costs up front in the hope that you're getting the return in the long run. But of course, for startups, there's uncertainty about the long run um, because, of course, you've got to prove that the market values what you're offering. So it really creates a very kind of interesting dynamic at the start. The other thing that's kind of quite challenging, I guess, in some respects is, you know, there's a lot of, you know, a capital in, in coming into B2B SaaS. But you look at the checks that, that get written in the US and they're kind of five and 10 times the size of the checks that get written in the UK, Ireland and Europe, right? So mm. it really makes it um, a, a difficult environment because, of course, the costs of acquisition now are going up and they're becoming, you know, more challenging to gain eyeballs. Uh, and similarly, the barriers to entry are lower. Um, so there's a lot more competition in the different verticals or categories. So really is this mix of kind of lots of things going on, Matt, that makes it uh, very interesting, but also very challenging. Yeah, I mean, you've got a lot of companies that have built really good moats because they've been around for, for quite a bit longer, which means it's very hard to sort of compete in that space, especially things around sort of SEO and stuff. So uh, so if, if we're sort of thinking about an early stage SaaS business then, when do you think they should be starting to think about marketing? Yeah, look, look they got to think from, from the get-go, right? Because, you know, ultimately there's a website that needs to be built and um, traffic needs to be driven to the website. Um, you know, the beauty of modern content management systems, as they're known, Matt, are there's ones like Squarespace um, and, and a more advanced version will be Webflow that are kind of entry level. So you don't need to burn a lot of cash, you know, building the most beautiful website. You can sort of get up and running pretty quickly on something like Squarespace, where at least there's a destination that you can send people to where they can kind of learn a little bit about your proposition. And um, the thing that you mentioned earlier is quite important. Longevity really is key, right? So the sooner you get some of these um, bits and pieces into place, the better, because of course, SEO and content is really, you know, it's very nuanced, but it's a long game, right? So content is is not immediate re- reward, but it's a, it's a long game. And, and sort of Google values things like domain authority and sort of number of mm. backlinks to a website and the kind of the quality of the content, but also the keywords you're writing about. So a long-winded answer, um, but you got to be thinking it from the start. Mm. There's another point I, I want to make that I think is, is 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 worth sharing with your with your listeners. Right, is that there's a classic mistake most early stage startups make, and a guy called Tom Tungus, um, who's a VC in the US and a kind of a 
you know, well-established writer on B2B SaaS and, you know, made this argument a couple of years ago and, and I totally buy into it is that often the first hire is the wrong type of marketing hire. And by that, I mean, um, and, and I laugh when, when you see people looking for growth marketers and the business is six months old and the kind of the growth marketer piece is kind of saying, hey, we really need leads as quickly as possible. And, and, and you know, we need to be hacking and doing all this sort of stuff when the reality is, and this is the inherent kind of tension, is that first year you need a product marketer. You, you need somebody that's not under pressure to generate leads because, you know, the whole point of that that kind of dynamic is that they need to be talking to prospects and what are called ideal customer profiles. They got to be in listening mode, not mm. selling mode. Mm. And, and and that's the bit that's really difficult in Europe because you're probably under pressure from VCs or a board or the CEO to kind of get cash in the door as quickly as possible. Mm. But if you try and do it prematurely, you know, your, your marketing people are, are, are not doing it, understanding the pain, who's got the pain, how big is the pain, do they understand, you know, your solution, how it potentially fits the needs of the pain, how would they buy solution? There's all these questions that you just can't get to unless you, you, you know, you um, really spend time in the trenches mm. and that is just so difficult. And when I look back at my career, you know, having been in B2B marketing for a number of years, it's the bit that I kind of look back and with some of my previous roles and go, you know, I missed a trick there. They were pushing me to generate leads. I should mm. have pushed back a little bit and said, look, it's premature. We need to spend more time in the trenches. Yeah, well, marketing then becomes a little bit like spray and pray to a certain degree, because like you say, you don't have the ideal customer in mind. And obviously the pain points to actually have a really, really targeted sort of message uh, to them. But I mean, how, how early is early then? Are, are we talking sort of before product market fit then? Are we, are we talking after that's been established? What yeah, I mean, so, so marketing is, is all encompassing, right? It, it covers like so many different dimensions, um, but things like even a domain name, right? So it's almost impossible to get a domain name these days. But actually, that's a key factor, right? So, you know, you, you pick an obscure domain name that really isn't very strong, and you know, is on a on a you know, the old days everything was a .dot com, and then we had some sort of funky things like .dot io and stuff. But <laughs> you know, it can be painful if you get that wrong, right? If you, mm. if you, you know, um, and similarly branding, right? And and you got to kind of trade off reversible versus irreversible decisions. Mm. So you can kind of live with with kind of um, you know basic branding initially, but then of course it's all nuanced. Going back to my earlier point, Matt, if you're doing a cybersecurity or a fintech type offering, like you know, trust and probity and brand equity are really, really important. You know, you can't have that on a Mickey Mouse looking <laughs> domain right. and a Mickey Mouse looking site, right? So again, I'm 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 gonna frustrate you during this call, I'm sure, yeah. right? Because part of it is is always this phrase, it depends. Uh, and I guess that's the bit that's um that's really kind of critical here. You know, you've got to almost look at it as as the lens as to, to what vertical you're in. You know, are you in a in a very competitive market that's mature? Or are you in a, an immature market with a groundbreaking, in, you know, new discovery? So, so it all varies, and this is why B two B SaaS is just so so fascinating, right? Um, but but I think you you got to have the you, you know, often you, you won't have a marketing founder that that's typical, right? So most co founders you you'll probably have um, a technical co founder, and if not, you you kind of should. Um, you know, you, you need a tech lead and then you might have a commercial lead who could be the CEO or that, that could be operations. You, you're unlikely to have a marketing, um, you know, you know, lead in the founding team, but you can't neglect marketing too early. And, and I, I would advocate, um, you know, recognizing that early on. And if you need to bring in some, you know, initially you could get freelance support or you can get a consultancy or you can get mm. a brand agency do, to do things for you. So, so I think, you know, and, and the last point, and I'm and I'm laughing as I say it, right? Is again, it depends, right? Obviously, if you've raised a check, you know, of, of four or five million, that's a very different context than if you're bootstrapping in the early days. Yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense. So imagine this scenario: then you're, um, we've got a company that's perhaps it understands its um, ICP, um, it's really clear on its the personas it's targeting, um, and now and perhaps they've run some sort of product market fit surveys and they're coming back sort of pretty positively. So now it is the sort of time to to perhaps put the gas on sort of outreach and sort of you know generating those leads. What sort of marketeer would you suggest they hire then as a sort of first time full time 
uh, sorry, first in full time marketer? Yeah, look, it's a great question. And so sort of this notion of product market fit actually is, is being challenged a little bit now as, as to kind of exactly um, does it really exist, right? And, and how mm. can you measure it? And it's sort of, and I've written actually about it because I think it is an interesting inflection point. But but I guess what, what I would take from it is that, um, you know, as soon as you're starting to get traction, which is probably a, a, a different way of looking at it, and by traction, I mean, you know, decent volumes of inbounds um, coming into your inbox and people genuinely interested in having a conversation. Um, I think then you, you, you know, you're looking at what I would deem a jack or jill of all trades, mm-hmm. right? That's, that's the kind of um, way I would describe the candidate. Um, and it's a difficult hire. Again, again, looking at UK and Ireland, you know, SaaS is still relatively, you, you know, new. And, and this sort of, we haven't had, you know, 50 years of B2B SaaS, right? I go back to remembering the 56K dial-up analogy, right? I remember those days. I, I sold software in boxes. I sold software in retail stores. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm not that old. So, you know, <laughs> it's, it's still a, a relatively young, young kind of industry. Yeah. And we haven't, you know, it takes in most instances probably 10 or 15 years to kind of, to, to get to kind of a, a liquidity event, be an exit or, or whatever. So we don't have huge volumes of these candidates in Europe. But um, mm. this Jack or Jill of all trades would be would be what I would would be hiring. Mm. Um, I mean, I like this nuance of B two B instead of B two C because I think that's an important distinction. Because you you you'll find it very difficult to get someone that's ticking B two B plus SaaS plus mm. marketing and and certainly not in your industry. So you're going to be conceding on loads of those, but. I think if they don't know B2B, you run the risk of um, a B2C playbook, which becomes then full of energy, full of Instagram, full of kind of um, uh, Snapchat, right? Which is not not what you need for B2B, right? And, mm-hmm. and sort of, um, so I think that's the key, the Jack or Jill of all trades that have got a bias for action, yeah. you know, high octane, high energy, willing to get stuff done, you know, don't need to be going to the CEO for everything. They can act autonomously because that's the other point. The CEO isn't going to have the answers. And then no. you need someone that can work fairly autonomously and that can recognize, uh, you, you know, um, uh, like what's a reversible decision and what's an irreversible decision, you know, and sort of, um, but, but I'm interested in your views, right? What, I mean, you're also hiring actively in the market. So, uh, you know, keen, keen to hear how you would approach it. Yeah. I mean, I think these are the toughest hires to make, to be honest, because I think a lot mm. of, of marketeers with these kind of skills know how challenging these sorts of roles are because, um, you know, it's almost like a blank sheet of paper. You've really got to go out there and sort of create something yourself. But also you've got to have the ability, like you said, to manage up as well as actually be hands-on enough to get the work done because you've got probably got very little support. Um, and then there's the pressure of obviously that sort of long-term versus sort of short-term piece. So, you know, my view is always that, um, you know, you've got to look at the soft skills first. So rather than focusing too heavily on, I need somebody who's done, pay, you know, pay-per-click or content, or whatever it might be, focus on those soft skills because actually you don't necessarily know what your channels are going to be. Um, this marketeer is going to start to come in and sort of hopefully identify maybe two or three channels that, that are going to give you a return and start to build on it from there. So I think sometimes companies get a bit too... Um, focused on um, the, the, the actual hard skills, the knowledge in certain channels, rather than actually focusing on that, has this person got the ability to actually do the many things within this kind of job, the strategic piece, the tactical piece, the budget management, the actual the data, the creative, you know, it's, a, it's an all-encompassing role, really. And you touched on it perfectly. There are more SaaS businesses now than there ever are, and they're growing year on year, but that pool of, of, of talent isn't really growing that much. So, you know, how do you find somebody who's already got the skills and who's already been there who wants to just go and do it again for a, another business? You know, there's so many exciting SaaS businesses out there. So I think the smartest companies are, certainly from what we're seeing, the smartest companies are kind of focusing on those softer skills rather than getting too focused on we need somebody from SaaS who's done paper. I think that's a great point. I think that's a great point, Matt. I mean, I look at, you know, when I look at CVs, I, I just don't look at the education piece anymore. It, it, yeah. do, it, do, it doesn't interest me. Um I, I do look at things like trying to unpack things like resilience, right? Because yeah. he, here's the point that, that yeah. you've actually made very well, right? Which I think is worth looking on is that you're dealing with profound uncertainty. Yeah. So this notion that you can write a brief that's saying they're going to be doing this and this and this, you know, 
I find it really challenging, right, to, to write OKRs and performance management people into these early stage roles because yeah. you come in the door and within within a month, the thing's completely <laughs> turned on its head, right? So <laughs> I, I think you, you, you're, you're right. The key really is to focus on adaptability, mm-hmm. bias for action, resilience, you know, getting stuff done, which is sort of similar. Mm-hmm. They're the bits that um, I, I think are really key. And mm. without putting you on the spot, I mean, I'd love your views on how you kind of unpack those in an interview, because they're the bits that I kind of find, you know, um, when I go interviews, they're the bits that I really need to try and unpack. And I probably sometimes feel I, I'm not well equipped to kind of, you, you know, unpack, um, yes. you know, is there a bias for action? Do they get yes. stuff done? Are they yeah. going to be resilient? Are they going to be adaptable? Yeah. Because often yeah. they don't have the track record. So you're, you're yeah. trying to unpack it. I mean, I, I don't know. Have you any ideas as to how you would well, tackle I it? Think that's, yeah, I mean, I think that's, it's a difficult one. It is a difficult one. I think recruiting people will always be a bit of a risk. But I think it's mm. more around the sort of questions that you're going to ask. You know, give me an example of a time when you did something. Give me an example, especially with, with sort of SaaS startups, give me a time when you faced uncertainty in your role and the strategy changed. You know, what happened? What did you do? How did you handle it? And what did you learn from it? So I think it's perhaps asking some of those questions to the candidate. I think then on the flip side, it's making sure that you're referencing people um, externally um, who have worked with these, you know, worked with candidates to, to get a, a view from their side. And then also, I think it's sort of giving a, a task to a marketeer at a later stage. Look, here's a, here's a real problem within our business that we're looking to solve. You don't want to be too ambiguous about it because you don't want people going off on tangents. But here's a real problem. How would you fix it? And it's not that you're necessarily looking for them to come up with the perfect answer, but you're just looking for them to come up with something that's logical, something that kind of makes sense. Um, and I think by piecing all those sort of three things together – you'll get a sense of whether or not this person is is right. But then also I think there needs to be a little bit more support for these people when they go into businesses as well. So rather than it being sort of really short-term, right, hang on, the leads are dropping, the pipeline's uh, dropping a bit, you know, what's happening? The CEO and the senior management team, the board, the leadership team need to also then give a little bit of breathing room to these marketeers because these roles are, are you know, challenging. And as you said, you know, invariably the strategy is going to change a little bit at times. So, you know, I think there needs to be sort of balance on, on both sides. But I think by covering those three areas, I think you'll perhaps narrow down a little bit more on 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 these sorts of people. Um, from you agree more. Yeah. I mean, just to unpack a couple of those points, you know, we're, we're just kind of sharing a couple of ideas. So it's competency based. Totally agree. Any, anybody I bring through, I, I get them to do a loom video. So I use Loom a lot, but I get, you know, critique the website in 15 minutes. I want to hear you, you yeah. know, if, if we want to grow traffic or grow leads, give me a 15 minute Loom video. And yeah. um, the other thing is that I look for the digital footprint, which I think is, you know, and it, the number of people I interview that are, oh, I'm brilliant at, you know, writing. Okay. Well, re- great. Yeah, yeah, I'm really, really good at writing. Okay. Mm. And where's the evidence, right? So, so like, mm. you know, if you're in marketing you, or sales, right, you should have a digital mm. footprint. I mean, there was one person, senior salesperson, I couldn't find them on LinkedIn. And that was enough for me to go, you know what, that's a risk I'm not willing to take. Because yeah. for me, yeah. you should have a digital footprint if you're in, you know, in marketing and sales, even if you're very junior, right? You should have mm. at least a basic LinkedIn account that's got some content up there and, and, and you know, write, okay? Because yeah. marketing includes the ability to write. So yeah. you don't have to be writing war and peace, right? But you can certainly have a couple of blogs on, on Medium or something that just demonstrates yeah. evidence, yeah. right, of, of ability rather than sort of um, trying to unpack it in an interview. Yeah, and I think those sort of challenges should, should be exciting to the right sort of marketeer because you should have an opinion on something you know when you come to a website generally as i think as a b2b marketeer you should be formulating an opinion on that uh, on that website so i think sort of sharing that sort of stuff should be quite exciting to 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 marketeers absolutely matt and just kind of picking up on the other point i think ceos and and board and so on need to be more um, patient which again is the point you made earlier because it's very easy to decide to churn a marketer out after a year right and that's Mm -hmm. often the case right the the kind of Mm -hmm. the tenure of people in marketing is you know particularly in in europe is probably one or two years it's not five or 
five or longer, right? And yeah. um, there are exceptions, of course, but but there's often a, you know, we're not hitting our leads, right? And it's kind mm. of, and there's this dance that goes on between product and sales and marketing, right? So mm. marketing are probably not happy that the product's got enough compelling features to make it um, stand out in terms of positioning it in the marketplace. Sales aren't happy with the lead volume or quality. You, you kind of have this dance, right? But, mm. you know, part of it is trying to be patient because if you exit someone, you know, and I've had this with, with kind of leadership trying to exit someone and, and I can see it's been ex- exited prematurely. And, and then you're looking to try and go into a very challenging market to hire mm. and someone spent a year building up their domain expertise. You, you've now lost them on, on kind of trumped up grounds. The lead velocity wasn't aligning with your business plan trajectory that secured your funding at the start. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it, it's sort of, a, it's an exit route for someone that actually hasn't done anything wrong. And then yeah. you're, you're back to square one, trying to bring in somebody that doesn't know the industry and has to go through all that learning again. Yeah. So there's yeah. some of the things that I, I kind of spot that just keep repeating, right? Yeah, you get into a tough cycle, don't you, really? So, uh, I mean, Alan, you've, in your career, you, you, you know, at the moment you help uh, sort of early stage SaaS business or SaaS businesses generally with their, uh, with their marketing. But when you sort of go into these business, how do you sort of prioritize what to do given the sort of the, almost the resources and the time are against you a bit? That is really a great question. And that's the one that I think if there's one thing, prioritization is the big challenge, right? Because you're getting, you're getting hit at it from all angles, right? So, you know, salespeople need collateral, they need localized content in some instances, you know, CEO wants this or that. Um, you know, again, you, you tend to get a lot of interference in marketing from different sort of functions. Um, and of course, everyone wants this hockey stick, you know, up to the top right, significant growth and month on month, uh, you, you know, fantastic growth, right? And, and it's really, really challenging because, mm-hmm. um, and you know, there are tools you can use, right? So I typically will use a Trello or a teamwork type application or a SANA to, to kind of manage priorities. Mm-hmm. But part of it is managing stakeholder expectations mm-hmm. because, you know, the wish list for marketing functions are, are ever long and ever growing. And I'm often looking around the room with, with some of my early stage startups. And this could be, you know, people that are at three, five million revenue even or have, have raised checks, right? And hmm. it's not like I have a team of five or 10, you know, and, and, and in many instances, you, you, you may have one Jack or Jill of all trades followed by somebody that maybe had been hired prior to you joining, right? And they could hmm. be a graphic designer or they could be someone else. So, it's really challenging the prioritization piece. Um, I, I still struggle with it, if, if I'm honest. I, I think it's, um, you know, because there's so many um, competing demands in your time. And, you know, I, I guess there's a couple of things that, that I try and do. So I try and, I, I had a story recently, right, whereby a classic one where a sales guy drops a head around the door, you know, I've just been talking to some VCs. We haven't been doing any webinars, you know, you know, why haven't we been doing any webinars? And I'm kind of like, okay, and he's asking me to do a webinar. Can we do a webinar next month? So I'm kind of trying to unpack that in my head. Mm-hmm. And what I'm getting at is like a webinar is, you know, you know, there's one person in the marketing function and, and sort of, you know, like that is a fairly significant amount of time hours. Or right? if I mm-hmm. looked at from start to finish, the amount of hours that you've got to put in to do a webinar from scratch but then you get to the point is nobody might show up right because your traffic on your website isn't strong enough to so you've got to pay five or ten grand to partner with somebody. Yeah. So so that's the kind of example of someone that kind of drops in a will we do a webinar, not yeah. really understanding that that's a, that is almost an unreasonable request for a for a, for an early stage startup. Whereas actually if it was, well, actually Alan, we need more leads, ah, that's a slightly different question then. So yeah. that's the reason you want to propose it. And, um, you know, maybe we can come up with a, with another solution. So, yeah, yeah it's a really tricky one. Um, I, I try and, uh, and I'm kind of laboring the point a little bit, but I try and have a process, right, so, so that at least there's some sort of order to it. Um, it needs to be fluid, right? There's always things going to change. Yeah. And then I'm trying to kind of, you know, whatever's closest to cash is often the way I, I will do it. So focusing on things, so that could be, um, if there's an RFP or RFQ that needs to be responded to and we need a nice deck for it, that's close to cash. Yeah. Google ads are often typically um, closest to cash because you can spike leads by, you, you know, by putting more cash into Google ads. So, you know, it yeah. might be building landing pages. They would get a priority. 
yeah. a webinar would probably be downgraded because I'd view that as a high risk, high cost type scenario that, that would have low probability of a return. Yeah. So there's some again be interesting your thoughts. Have you kind of any any tips that you might share that would help? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I think you, you're touching on the sort of framework that I was thinking of, and you see the sort of frameworks being used by growth marketers a little bit more because they go sometimes a bit deeper into things like, you know, changing the landing page, changing the product sometimes with new features, as well as kind of that marketing piece. But you know, they draw up that framework of sort of um, you know high reward versus or reward versus cost or uh, you know time needed and they'll sort of map it out in terms of okay well what do we think is actually going to work really well and then actually how much time and effort is it going to take and they can sort of start to plot which is the high reward stuff versus which is the high reward and the low effort and they sort of just literally start chunking it down from from that, and that's how they they, they sort of tend to prioritise it. But um, that's that's exactly it. Um, I mean, the only other thing to throw into the mix is whether it's, there's dependencies or not, because that's a key thing that junior marketers don't realise. Right, yeah. is that you there's a huge amount of dependencies, and of course the, it's with busy people, right? So one yeah. of my um, companies I work with was in cybersecurity. And that's a real challenging area for marketing because it's almost impossible to get somebody that's got marketing and cyber security experience, right? Mm. I mean, they just don't exist, right? Mm. So mm. the challenge there is content creation, right? So you're really dependent on, on you know, your thought leaders that are, you know, exceptionally busy. So you'll often find in instances like that, you just simply can't prioritize mm. things like content creation, even though it is useful from an SEO and kind of cost of acquisition point of view. Mm. Content is often really, really important, but you just can't move the needle on it because you've got too many dependencies on on fee earners often if it's professional services or even even if it's a pure SaaS that the one or two domain experts, you'll often find they may not be able to communicate well. They're very technical, right? But they're, they're not able to kind of identify, here's a thought leadership piece that we should write that should have these keywords and they don't have that. And so, so you kind of have to prioritize also based on your context. Um, mm. And then the kind of last point to watch is that a lot of the playbooks we get, um, Matt, are coming across from the US, right? And often, you know, that's where we read and that's where we listen to, you know, anybody that I listen to or read in this area typically are in the US, right? I go back to an earlier point. They've got resource abundance. We've got resource constraints. Mm. So they're advising you from the world of, 10 people in marketing and, 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 you know, we can have the latest tech stack. We can have the greatest tech stack because we've got loads of cash. Yeah. The kind of more lean model is much more challenging. And, and, and another kind of point on it is that like you can struggle to get statistical significance on B2B sites. So it's easy to say, go test all these landing pages and we can kind of pick the winner. You know, that's not really that easy on a, on a B2B SaaS site because, you know, your traffic volumes are typically quite low. Mm. Um, and then the kind of geeky point to be aware of is that actually most traffic that you see in Google Analytics is overstated by 30 or 40%. Mm. And you've got to take that off. So you might think you've actually got 5,000 visits a month. The reality is it's probably closer to 2,000. Yeah. Because why? You've got people coming in to log into the website that that's counted. You've got internal IP traffic people on the site. You get bots and you can see the bots that are the people that are staying less than a second um, so there's all these, you know, things that are kind of making it kind of, you know, tricky to kind of actually test. So yeah. anyway, I, I'm going off the point I, a little yeah. bit. But uh, <laughs> I'm expecting you to have eight pairs of hands. I can't see with all this stuff you're doing. <laughs> so what about from a sort of um, a, a tactical perspective? Um, you know, you talked earlier about playbooks and, and there isn't necessarily a playbook, but what sort of strategies do you tend to, to use or what tactics do you tend to use to generate leads and awareness for sort of SaaS businesses? Yeah, look, I, I think I have a philosophy of continuous improvement as one. So, so you always got to be looking at kind of, um, you know, trying to improve. So again, I'm very data driven, very kind of conscious of unit economics. So I'm, I'm uh, again, my background, you know, academically is economics and marketing. So I kind of, I get to wear two hats and a bit unusual that way. So I think that that's definitely, you know, one of the elements. Um, I think, you, you know, there, there's a kind of a real um, sense of there's no silver bullets. It's trying to, you, you kind of do lots of different things. Um, some will stick, some, some will not. I mean, Google ads will always play a part, right? Um, when you know your keywords, because, you know, it's a very powerful tool, right? People are searching for problems they have. Mm -hmm. And if you've got, got solutions to, to um, you know, to the problems, 
you know, that will always help with Legion. But often, Matt, it, it's a real, real mix of of conversations and, and stuff that you do. And look, some of it's measurable, some of it's not. And that's the frustrating piece. So everybody wants perfect attribution. Can we see where all those leads come from so we can repeat the recipe? Mm. Um, you know, often it, it's... it's um, it's not as easy as that. And I'll share one example from a few years ago to just kind of illustrate the point. You know, I was working in an early stage um, um, start a B2B SaaS that had a phenomenal product, but it was complex. It was, it was artificial intelligence, but it was really early days. And we were really struggling to make a breakthrough because, you know, the academic founder was very technical, very bright guy, but, you know, we were just our messaging, we, our ability to kind of bring in leads, it was really compromised by, it was just so early, right? And um, I was at an event and I heard a, a speaker, right? And, and and sort of, it was the first guy that, you know, that I heard that was actually talking the same language as, as we were, right? And he was a PhD in economics. And, you know, I went up to him afterwards and, and I, I just had a little bit of a chat and, and I made the introduction to the CEO and it wasn't salesy per se, but it was the first time I recognized, actually, this is our ideal customer profile. Mm-hmm. This guy really knows the space. He's a thought leader. He's cutting edge. Um, and, and I made the connection and sort of roll on two years later, you know, this guy brought in the biggest client that this company ever had because, you, you know, and, and they're now a marquee name and they're a world brand. And it was sort of, you know, it was really, so it was one simple example of a lead that was generated on on going the hard yards, but kind of really, you know, recognizing actually, you know, here's what we're missing. You know, our messaging isn't landing. This is the first guy now while I've heard. Let's not be salesy to the guy. Let's let's speak to him as on, on his level. And actually, he kind of the light bulb exploded in his head when he heard what we were doing. He really understood the proposition because you know he was on that level. So, so that's the kind of an idea that that could shape some of the thoughts around Legion. Lots of different things, um, and just measuring then and innovating as you go. Mm. And I think it's having the ability to to see that kind of information coming in rather than just having the the attitude of let's just execute stuff. You're always got to be listening, looking for signs, signals, data that's coming in. And that, that sort of conversation is, is a great example of that. So this is probably pertinent to yourself, Alan, then. So once you've sort of found those you know, one or two channels that, that work then, how would you suggest somebody scales output given they probably can't hire full-time employees yeah look look, i'm a great believer in, in the kind of freelance um market right and, and i am one myself right so i'm a, I'm a consultant to, to a number of different clients and i think that you know there are a huge number now of you know talented people that are that are available on the freelance market the challenge is probably finding them right so upwork upwork is probably not the best place for some of these specialists they tend to be word of mouth right they tend to be not on on you know these upwork channels again if you're budget constrained upwork will be fine but often it's sort of um word of mouth or, or, or you know there is an ecosystem in places like dublin london berlin where there are you know i've got an ecosystem right a b2b SaaS marketing ecosystem whereby i know if i need a google ads guy i've got my go-to guy if i need a um, a visual identity or brand refresh. I, I know I've got my kind of go-to person for that. Mm-hmm. So messaging, right? There's this phenomenal um, uh, messaging person, right? Who helps with B2B SaaS messaging, who's based in New Zealand, right? Mm-hmm. My UI UX guy that I use is based in Thailand. So um, there is a kind of an emerging ecosystem of freelancers that are very specialist and Look, it's it's you know very very cost effective because you're not bringing them onto the books as a um, as a full time employee. The other thing is there's a number of kind of marketplaces emerging as well, right? Which are which are you know gaining traction, recognition, and sort of again they're they're not the the, the Upwork model, but they're more dedicated for B two B SaaS. So searching on those again, are, you know, represent areas that you can can find talent. Hmm. Um, so I, I think it's you know it's a great way to grow your business, um, particularly around speciality areas like even Google Ads, um, you know, as an example. So paid advertising is often one of the ways you're going to spike your lead velocity, and you know Google Ads is a complete beast. So um, you know, it's just very complicated, you know. And when you look at things like attribution, and, and you look to try and involve your model, 
you do need speciality um, resource. So, so that would be my re- recommendation, suggestion, mm. trying to kind of tap into your B2B SaaS ecosystem. Um, you know, and there, there are things like SaaS stock, which is a huge community in, in, in the UK and Ireland um, and Europe, in fact, that, again, you know, is worth plugging into and, and sort of people that are in the freelance community tend to, to kind of migrate towards communities like that. Mm, makes sense because I think you can get uh, you can get bogged down a little bit too much if you don't have that kind of support. Really, you know, even just writing a, a, a long blog post <laughs> it takes longer than you think. Absolutely, but I think you've got some area of interest in this, right? Yes, very much so. Yeah, I mean, we've we've sort of started very early days a a, a platform um, and essentially a marketplace which is dedicated to to, to B two B tech marketeers. So, uh, and that's helping companies either hire full-time employees or freelancers. But but those people have got experience of kind of working in this space because I see it more often than not. You know, you, you've got these sort of emerging businesses, early stage businesses that, that kind of need everything, but, you know, they can't afford to bring in a whole team straight off the bat. So, I mean, you touched mm-hmm. on it in terms of funding. You know, they're not raising you know, hundred million off the bat. So, uh, so it's very hard to actually build that, that team from, from the get go. So using freelancers, I think is a, is a great way to be able to scale that kind of stuff. Um, so well, yeah, well, it is for us. Yeah. And look, an exciting space to be in because I, I yeah. think that model is going to just grow and grow, right? Because, mm-hmm. um, you know, things like graphic design or collateral, like you, you need stuff like that, but you don't need someone full time that, that sort of, um, you know, um, this goes back to the kind of jack of all trades because actually what, what they need are Jill of all trades, right? What they need to be able to do is probably coordinate some of this, right? So, hmm. um, you, you know, because what you get is you, you get a kind of coordination challenge, but you also get the challenge of, of kind of how do you pick the best ones, right? So hmm. I think marketplaces like you're putting together, you know, which hopefully will have some ranking or rating system or, or one, hmm. you know, an ability to kind of triage the best is, is definitely kind of very important. Well, if you don't have any VC, send them my way. <laughs> We're getting towards the end of this one, Alan, so, uh, which has been fantastic so far. But w- one last sort of question then. What do you see com- SaaS companies failing? Why, why does marketing typically fail within these businesses? That is a great point, um, a great question. Um, I could dodge it and blame product, right, and say that the product <laughs> uh, wasn't compelling enough. But, but I think... I think there's actually some truth in that, right? In, the, in that actually it's a holistic view you have to take. You can't really take the silo um, of it. It's, it's rare for one function to kind of to fail in its own, right? I think there's a kind of a collective, um, you know, success or failure, right? But I think some things to look at, we've been touched on right at the start of this call, right? So I think you can, you know, you can try and be, you know, all things to everybody where you're where you're really just not focused and it's kind of, you know, you, you ask who are your ideal customer profile and it's like it's horizontal. It's like every industry and every kind of persona possible, you know, it's just lacking focus. So what you're doing is you're trying to broaden the market um, because you can't get enough leads in the sector that you're in. And all of a sudden your messaging isn't resonating anymore. Um, so, so really, I'd argue you got to be as narrow as you can. Mm-hmm initially so really tightly narrow you can always expand afterwards so, so that's an area that i think is a cause of failure mm. i think you know not validating that the the pain exists and kind of really like what one of my you, you know more successful startups that i work with the, the ceo basically burnt out two iphones right he was on the phone so much talking to prospects and listening and um and, and sort of that disconnect can happen if you go back to the earlier conversation on marketing, having to do so much, you know, you can get very disconnected from the, the customer pretty early on, right? Because you've got to fire up landing pages and you've got to fire up Google ads and you've got to write content. And it just feels you don't have time to be spending it in the trenches talking to people. So that that's the bit that I think is, is also, um, um, you know, key that you're, you're like, you can be very disconnected from the front line. So I'm always kind of a very strong advocate of sales and customer support saying, guys, we need a strong feedback mechanism. You know, we really need so. So I've got with most of my clients, if there's a Slack, which will often be used, I've got literally channels in there where sales put in, there's one channel to keywords, right? So what are the phrases people are using on calls? And every so often I'll get a keyword dropped in. And I'll research and go, okay, you know, there's a pattern here. A lot of people are using this keyword. We were never really talking about this keyword on our website. Let's go and write some content on it. 
or feature requests. What what are the features that people are putting in when they're asking, um, you know, to use our service? And I feed that back to product. So I think that, you know, operating in silos is, is one of the things, but also this sort of, you're all in it together. And I think that this kind of, particularly when we're all remote, you've got to almost dial up the communication between the different elements because, you know, you're disconnected from the customer in, in these modern businesses and that's a very dangerous place to be. So that's kind of my, my area. I think that there is a, is often a, a falling down. Well, I really like that answer because in a way that's kind of the unglamorous foundational aspects really, isn't it? You know, it's really exciting to go and build a new website and, you know, do some new messaging and, you know, do some paid ads and stuff like that. But actually the fundamental stuff is, is, you know, it's, it's, it's so important. Um, so it's a, it's a really good answer. If people want to reach you, Alan, what's the best way of them getting hold of you? Yeah. Best way is um, my website is workwithagility.com. So workwithagility.com and um, lots of blogs and extra resources on there. If people want to, um, to read any of the stuff that I've written. Perfect. Well, I've really enjoyed this conversation. I'm not sure what your title is, but it should also perhaps be magician as well with, with everything that you have to do on a day-to-day basis. So uh, I really appreciate you sharing your, uh, your insights with our audience. Thanks so much. Listen, really great chatting to you and uh, appreciate the opportunity. Great stuff. Thank you.